The Minnesota Vikings opened their 1972 season with the Washington Redskins before a Monday night television audience. Almost prophetically, the season got off on the wrong foot when Bill Malinchak blocked Mike Eyshide's first punt and returned it 16 yards for a stunning go-ahead touchdown. But Minnesota rooted in and made a game of it, with Fran Tarkenton converting 12 of 19 third down situations, and with newly acquired receiver John Gilliam's spectacular receptions, the game was tight. Until a Viking fumble set up back-to-back -back Redskin touchdown. When it was over, a search of the record books revealed it had been 11 years since a Vikings punt was blocked. Against a pea soup fog in Detroit, a backdrop suitable for either a Sherlock Holmes mystery movie or a grim Central Division struggle, the Minnesota Vikings visited Tiger Stadium, seeking their ninth consecutive victory over the resident Detroit Lions. Of course, the return of number 10, Fran Tarkington, is the big difference in the black and blue division this year. And Tarkington and slick outside receiver John Gilliam had a whole new dimension in difficulty for those who would try to unseat the Vikes as the perennial champions of the NFC Central Division. Tarkington supplied the key play in Minnesota's first goalward thrust. Whether you call it scrambling or opportunistic offense, Fran stepped deep into Detroit territory. Then Dave Osborne burst through a trap at right guard for 14 yards and a touchdown. A replay shows us that right guard Milt Sunday caught number 53 middle linebacker Mike Lucci in a blitz. And number 62 left guard Eddie White closed the trap on number 70 Larry Woods and Osborne was home free. Tarkington took it in again with the help of John Gilliam on a 40-yard pass, and Detroit was in a hole. The combative Carl Kosalki, number 29, picked Landry's pocket first. And facing the Purple Gang was not a fortunate circumstance for Greg Landry. Number 20, Bobby Bryant's cat burglary was followed, if less artfully, by a couple of blunt heists by Roy Winston and number 59, Lonnie Warwick. Warwick's interception served to greet number 19, Bill Munson, Minnesota Viking style. All these thefts, of course, kept Take It In Tarkington rather busy. Fran set up one score with a pitch to Dave Osborne. And he collected his second touchdown pass of the day with a 13-yard strike to Dave Osborne, who took it in standing up Viking style, making it 34 to 10 in the end. The next Sunday in Detroit, the Vikings started all over again. Dave Osborne crashed over for three touchdowns. The defense contributed four interceptions. Fran Tarkenton and John Gilliam were spectacular. And the Minnesota Vikings thumped the Detroit Lions for the ninth consecutive time, building a 34-10 triumph. In Minnesota, the Viking fans practiced the happy art of tailgating royally. But quiche in costumes is strictly an hors d'oeuvre for these gourmets. And the main course, filet of greasy dolphin, was yet to be served. 
On his first series, Fran Tarkenton hit with the old persimmon pass, drawing in the Dolphin defense and hitting John Gilliam all alone for a 56-yard catch and carry touchdown. Meanwhile, the Purple Gang put the zonk on the Miami attack. Number 60, Roy Winston doing the honors here. After Dick the Stick Anderson stole the ball from Minnesota's Bill Brown, Greasy frittered away Miami's only scoring chance in the first half with this interception by number 20, Bobby Bryant. Late in the third period, number 32, Oscar Reed's 22-yard sweep sparked an 80-yard 13-play touchdown drive. With fourth and a half yard to go, Bill Brown dove across, establishing the Vikings' lead at 14 to 6. Employing a little razzle-dazzle to overcome penalties, Marlon Briscoe pass complete to Jim Mandich, setting up Garrow Upremian's third field goal, a 51-yarder. Upremian's boot ended almost 10 minutes of Miami ball control in the fourth period. And now the no-name defense had to face down the Tarkenton mob. With 2.11 left, Miami regained the ball, aided by a roughing penalty on Bob Lertzema. An unrushed Bob Greasy found Howard Twilley for 17 more yards in the throat of the Vikings zone. On the next play, Bob Greasy hit Jim Mandich for a touchdown, making Don Shula the only undefeated coach in the NFL, defeating the Vikings 16 to 14. Next, Bob Greasy and the Miami Dolphins invaded the Mets. But Tarkenton stung the blitzing Dolphins early, finding Gilliam with a touchdown pass for the third straight week. And then some convincing defense held the Dolphins at bay. A crucial roughing penalty jolted the Miami attack to life late in the game. And the Dolphins' only touchdown a greasy to Mandich hookup was enough to put Minnesota on the short side of a 16-14 score. The next week, another cliffhanger was lost to the Cardinals when Fred Cox's chip shot field goal rebounded the wrong way off the goalpost. Last Sunday, the St. Louis Cardinals entered the lair of the grape-clad people crushers. Card coach Bob Holloway must have expected the very worst, as even he warmed up the old firing pin. And of course, the Vikings did their thing, which is crash, crunch, crackle, and pop. Number 26, Clint Jones, scored once for the Vikings in answer to two St. Louis field goals. Larry Wilson's runout was discounted as Jones had scored before the fumble.
Cardinal quarterback Gary Cuazzo, an ex-Viking, was not intimidated as he hit Bobby Moore to regain the lead. The Vikings took it back on a Fran Tarkington to Gene Washington pass. Late in the fourth quarter, Gary Coazzo hit Moore again and seemingly iced the game at 19 to 17. But with less than a minute remaining, the Purple Gang drove furiously to the St. Louis 19, where with four seconds left, Fred Cox tried the winning field goal. But the winning field goal was a loser as it hit the right upright, which in this case was the wrong upright. And last Sunday night, the Minnesota cocktail flags flew for a long time as the Vikings lost their third of four starts, 19 to 17. Broncos then came up tough against the Vikings, and only some last-second heroics by Fran Tarkenton and Gene Washington salvaged Minnesota's second victory. On the surface, the Denver Broncos looked the same, but this season they have gone through a re-indoctrination period with new head coach John Ralston. Ralston believes in the emotional aspect of the game, even joins his kickoff team in the pregame huddle. The rookie head coach from Stanford is determined to build a winner on his own terms, but it is unlikely that he faced a team in college like the Minnesota Vikings. The Vikings defense came out breathing fire, a direct result of the team's unsightly one and three record. They gave Fran Tarkington plenty of field position and the Minnesota offense plotted along true to form. Number 30, Bill Brown set up one touchdown and Fred Cox kicked three field goals for the 16 points. Minnesota used to be able to win with 16 points. But Denver began getting the ball to a man who was born to test tough defenses. Number 44, Floyd Little, took a flare pass 32 yards for Denver's first score, and suddenly, the fabled purple people leaders did not seem quite so invincible. Little directly challenged Minnesota's strength and came up with 100 tough yards and three touchdowns. Little's performance gave Denver the emotional edge that Ralston seeks and the Bronco defense responded. Rookie Tom Graham, number 83, picked up on Dave Osborne's error as Denver put on fourth quarter pressure. Then number 12, Charlie Johnson, added another element to the Bronco attack by passing to Rod Sherman, number 84, with time running out. Less than a minute remained when Little sliced in for his third touchdown and a 20 to 16 lead. Ralston's sky-high Broncos were sure they had just delivered Minnesota loss number four. The Vikings had only 22 seconds to score, but Fran Tarkington was finally ready with the big play everyone has been expecting from him all season. Number 84, Gene Washington, gathered in his 31-yard touchdown, and the Vikings were home free with a hairy 23-20 victory. The usually stoic Vikings knew how close they had come to total demise. 
But with a 2-3 record in the tough Central Division, they still have a long way to go before they're declared fit and healthy once again. In their second Monday night test, this time versus the Chicago Bears, mistakes rendered the Vikings punchless for most of the game. But in the final moments, number 10 revived the issue with a masterful drive. And when John Beasley controlled Tarkenton's layup pass, the game appeared to be won. But a flag sighting an illegal receiver downfield nullified the score. When Fred Cox's field goal attempt to tie slipped offline in the dark, leaving two victories against four defeats, the glitter of the Viking summer of 72 had ended. The Vikings invaded Green Bay with the certain knowledge that one more loss would surely eliminate them in the NFC Central. The task at hand was the Packers and both teams flashed some early muscle. While the Packers beat down Fran Tarkenton, number 88, Alan Page, showed he had regained his all-pro form. To deny the Green Bay rush, Fran Tarkenton rolled out, but nothing could deny the Pack once they had the receiver in their sights. Green Bay forced the brakes early and cashed in on them on the running and receiving of all-purpose back John Brockington, number 42. Green Bay led 10-0 on a field goal and a perfect pass from Scott Hunter to old reliable Carol Dale. The Packers moved easily at times in the second half, but they could manage only one more field goal. On the other hand, the Vikings, forced to play catch-up, doggedly fought back. Finally, after three quarters, the game was tied at 13. Then the Purple Gang rediscovered their missing magic and forced two grievous errors by Scott Hunter. First, Hunter hung a throw that was converted into a touchdown by Paul Kraus. Minutes later, another Hunter pass deflected off MacArthur Lane and Wally Hilgenberg glad-handed it. Hilgenberg's touchdown gave Minnesota a come-from-behind 27-13 victory. Once more, the Purple Gang rejoiced with that old 40-for-60 spirit. The seventh game. Minnesota faced the suddenly supercharged Green Bay Packers. Both teams needed this victory badly but the Vikings would be dead without it. From early on, the Packers made it clear they were out to bury the Vikings. A 13-13 tie held until late in the game when Paul Krause, the perennial all-pro safety, picked off a Packer pass and put Minnesota ahead. Number 58, Wally Hilgenberg, then collected this deflection to ice the game 27-13. It was a vital victory, scored by the defense. The once powerful Vikings entered the second half of the season with only three victories, none of them at home. The once fearsome Viking defense had reached the passer less than once per game. 
But last week brought the New Orleans Saints, and for once, the Vikings looked not only purple, but powerful. This fumble return by number 40, Charlie West, was disallowed, but West later had another chance to be spectacular. The NFC's top-rated defense intercepted Archie Manning three times. Fran Tarkenton's record was better. In 26 attempts, he completed 19 passes, some of which made quite an impression upon the field photographers. Tarkenton also threw two touchdown passes, one to the oldest running back in pro football, Bill Brown a still spry 34-year-old. Tarkenton's other touchdown was more like the kind we have come to expect from Frantic Francis. Tight end John Beasley got credit for this touchdown, and when the score got high enough, a new passing combination was born. Number 19, backup quarterback Bob Lee, to number 42, wide receiver John Gilliam. This 63-yard pass and run, the Vikings' longest of the year, set the stage for the same combination to finish the scoring. As Minnesota prepared for first place Detroit by polishing off last place New Orleans 37-6. And the following week against the Saints, the Purple Gang continued their aggressive play. Fran Tarkenton soon built an impressive lead. When Bob Lee took over, there was no slack in the Minnesota attack. The Vikings seemed reborn with old wisdom as Allen. Last week, the Minnesota Vikings came charging out, rubbing their hands with glee because their opponents were Greg Landry and the Detroit Lions, a team they never lose to. From the beginning, number 88, Allen Page, Harris Landry, and the Minnesota defense held the Lions to one first down in the first half. Meanwhile, Minnesota's Oscar Reed, number 32, gobbled up great chunks of purple yardage, and the Vikings dominated. But when Oscar was called upon at the one-yard line, he fumbled, and Detroit recovered. Early in the third period, Oscar made up for his mistake by slashing 20 yards to put the Vikings ahead 10 to nothing. finally snarled back on a Greg Landry to Larry Walton hookup, good for 49 yards and seven points. And then, showing a flair for the unexpected, Greg Landry faked a field goal and scampered for a crucial first down. Landry then dropped back and fired another strike to Larry Walton to put the Lions ahead 14 to 10 with time on their side. But alas, the Lions' victory was never to be. Their own mistakes set up two Minnesota field goals and they trailed 16 to 14.
With five seconds left, Errol Mann tried what would have been the winning 33-yard field goal. But the kick was blocked by Bobby Bryant. And while Errol Mann joins that long list of kickers who could have won games but didn't, the Vikings made it 10 in a row over the Lions, who really ought to undergo collective psychoanalysis to see why the color purple frightens them so. Age observed quietly, you know, it's not how good you are, it's how bad you want to win. And the Vikings wanted to win very badly indeed when they faced the rival Detroit Lions for the second time. For the full first half, Minnesota rolled freely over the Lions without doing any appreciable damage on the scoreboard. But beginning the second half, Oscar Reed hauled in for the Vikings' first touchdown. Late in the game, Detroit began hitting the big one. And trailing by only two points, with only five seconds remaining, the Lions moved into sure field goal range. Errol Mann's field goal attempt was blocked by Bobby Bryant. It was the biggest play of the season, and the sudden turnabout had lifted the Vikings back into serious title contention. It was the 10th consecutive defeat of the Lions, and the Vikings were back in character. But in sunny L.A., this season of contrasts held still another irony. When two commanding defenses faced offenses with no appetite at all and were devoured. The Vikings were already well in arrears when Paul Kraus put Minnesota back in business with this fumble recovery and runaway touchdown. Then Tarkenton hit for what must have seemed like a long, long touchdown to number 30, Bill Brown. The Rams then took their turn. Tarkenton and John Henderson further shredded the Rams' secondary. And then Fran Tarkenton preempted the Rams' turn, finding John Gilliam, super fly in flight, to claim a hotly contested 45-41 struggle between the NFC's top two defensive powers. Loyal Viking followers went nuts. Although they were still only one game over 500, the Minnesota Vikings were ranked first in the NFC in total defense just ahead of Tommy Prothro's Rams, who were second. That was before last Sunday's game. It all started innocently enough with Roman Gabriel lobbing sore arm passes to a variety of Ram receivers. Jim Bertelson scored the game's first touchdown despite some rough handling by number 58, Wally Hilgenberg. In the first half, the Rams built up a surprising 20 to 10 lead, mostly because of Roman Gabriel's equally surprising 13 completions in 15 attempts. The second half was very different. On the first play from scrimmage, Willie Ellison was tackled by Jim Marshall. The ball came loose and Paul Krause found an easy 30 yard path to the end zone. On the next series, faced with third and 14, Fran Tarkington looked for his old buddy, Bill Brown, who certainly doesn't act like the oldest running back in the league. Brown's 76-yard play put the Vikings ahead for the first time, 24 to 20, but only until Willie Ellison set up the go-ahead touchdown for Los Angeles. At the end of three quarters, the Rams led 27-24. But on the first Viking series of the fourth period, Fran Tarkinen went long for John Henderson. Mm -hmm. 
Henderson's 70-yard touchdown put Minnesota ahead again, this time 31-27. And just two plays later, Roman Gabriel threw the game's only interception to Bobby Bryant. Tarkenton again found Bill Brown, and the Minnesota lead increased 38 to 27. The Rams were not done yet. Gabriel fluttered a pass to Jack Snow, good for 29 yards. In all, Jack Snow caught eight for 112 yards, while Willie Ellison ran for 104 yards, and the touchdown which brought the Rams close once again 38 to 34. Close was not good enough because in the very next series, Targeton once again went long, this time friend to John Gilliam. Gilliam's 66 yarder gave Tarkenton four touchdowns and over 300 yards passing, and Viking fans could barely contain themselves. For the day, Roman Gabriel hit 25 of 33, including one final touchdown to rookie Joe Sweet. All told, the two top-ranked defensive teams in the conference gave up 86 points and over 800 yards, and it's no wonder that the Coliseum scoreboard just couldn't cope with it. Coach Bud Grant explained, we used our warm weather offense. Whatever it was, Minnesota won it 45 to 41. At Metropolitan Stadium, the cheerleaders snowballed each other silly in preparation for the avalanche that was to come. The Purple Gang banged the Bears at will, and the ball became the only hot thing in the subarctic freeze. Whenever the Bears approached Minnesota's goal line, number 81 Carl Eller wrapped up the runners like Christmas presents. One of the rare moments of joy for the Bears came when number 48 Ron Smith, the gingerbread man, cake walked 81 yards to a touchdown on a punt return. Unfortunately for the gingerbread man, his run to glory was aborted by a clipping penalty. Viking quarterback Fran Tarkington often found number 42 John Gilliam running free and easy in the deep seams of the Chicago zone. The shaky line between possession or incompletion brought out the beast in the Bears, Abe Gibron. Undaunted, Tarkenton kept on firing. Gilliam kept on receiving, and the Bears kept on hitting. The Vikings' first touchdown resulted from another Tarkenton bullet through the crease to John Henderson, number 80. Minnesota's only other touchdown came when number 35, Jim Harrison, was crushed in the purple mix master. Harrison fumbled to Bobby Bryant, who raced to an easy score as the Northmen ho-hummed their way past the Bears, 23 to 10. Play from scrimmage served notice of what kind of day it was to be for Steve Spurrier and the 49ers. Carl Eller came up empty despite a great defensive play. Edwards fumble and the recovery and long return by number 40, Charlie West, gave the Vikings a ball on their opponent's 16-yard line. Three plays later, Fran Tarkenton speared Ed Marinaro over the middle, and the rookie running back took it in for his first touchdown as a pro. Minnesota 7, San Francisco nothing.
At the start of the second quarter, Minnesota got a great run back of its own when Clint Jones burned 48 yards. time today, Spurrier passed right into the hands of Paul Krause on the 17-yard line. Minnesota soon gave the ball back with a disastrous error of their own. At the start of the second half, the 49ers were still cautious of Clint Jones' return threat, but Gossett's squib to Bill Brown was returned to good field position on the Viking 36. After reaching midfield, Tarkenton faced a third down, and by outscrambling Dave Wilcox, number 64, he got the first down. Penalty further moved the ball to the 10, but from there, Wilcox defused Tarkenton's bullet. It was the third time Minnesota had been in close, yet came away with no points, and these failures were keeping the 49ers in the game. On Minnesota's next possession, they would get close again, as a good play fake and a perfect pass freed Brown for 31 yards. But after another pass gained nine and three quarter yards, the 49ers stiffened. Brown lost four on a run, then Tarkenton lost 14 more. Though the Vikings had had a second and inches on the 49er 18, they had to settle for a Fred Cox field goal and led 10 to six. Less success. Spurrier's pass intended for Gene Washington and intercepted by Jeff Seaman was their fifth turnover of the game. On the 49er sideline, there were rumblings of Brody. Spurrier would not have won a popularity contest with his showing today, and to make matters worse, Tarkenton turned Spurrier's last turnover into a touchdown with a perfect pass to John Gilliam. Gilliam had dropped the same pass earlier in the game, but he held on this time, and with two minutes left in the third quarter, Minnesota led by 11. He forced his pass to Qualic, and Paul Krause intercepted his second theft, and San Francisco's sixth turnover. But again, Brody misfired, and Seaman intercepted his second interception, and San Francisco's seventh turnover. Now, smelling victory, stepped up into the pocket and hit Gene Washington, who had a step on Charlie West. The play gained 53 yards, and three plays later, Washington outfought Bob Bryant for the touchdown. Brody had moved the 49ers over 99 yards in two and a half minutes, but the celebration was kept to a minimum, for San Francisco still trailed by four with just over six minutes to play. A Brody pass. Third down and 30 seconds away from elimination, Brody rolled out and directed traffic.
Just 25 seconds remained when Brody hit Dick Witcher and sent San Francisco into the playoffs. Minnesota would get the ball once more, but they could not score. John Brody had risen from the depths of the bench to lead San Francisco into the playoffs for the third straight season. It was a remarkable turnaround for Brody. At 37, he does not have many seasons left. And with 27-year-old Steve Spurrier playing so well, this indeed could have been Brody's last year. Vikings' roughneck style has won them their fans. Hit and gouge and win, that's the Vikings action that the fans love. And it's in that way that the Minnesota Vikings will turn the corner to claim new prominence in 1973. With the help of a reshod running game and with a now familiar Fran Tarkenton at the helm, both the offense and the defense are skilled, experienced units. If anything remains to be said of this long and disappointing season, one can be sure that the experience of 1972 will make this good team want to win very badly in 1973. And victory will be remarkably sweet. <laughs>